Okay. It's almost Swiss like. It's just coming up to bang onto the clock. <laughs> precision. <laughs> precision timing yeah. of the music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, how's everyone today? Yeah. Nervous? Yes. Why? <laughs> I don't understand why. <laughs> Must be at the principal's office. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it feels a lot of times. Almost feels like I've got to go already before I start. <laughs> but this is about fear of truth, really, isn't it? It's yeah. about fear of truth, yeah. yeah. So that's one of your addictions, straight away, right there. Your addiction to not hear the truth because you're afraid of it. Does that make sense? And whenever you have an opportunity of hearing the truth, if it was me, I'd be going, you beauty, hello. <laughs> you got this great opportunity. Um, and uh, it's pretty rare to, get, to actually hear truth from a person who you believe is, is, has your loving interests at heart. Because most of the time people want to tell you the truth when they don't have their loving interests at heart at all, yeah. right? So, you know, that, it's a pretty rare occasion to hear truth. So it's... it's Something worth doing, I feel, is, is having this openness towards truth. But we'll discuss that as we go along. And what I wanted to ask you first is some personal comments about your reason for attending today. So why'd you come? Matt, if we just, uh, just be careful of the camera there. Thanks. For that exact reason that you just said, I... When I reflect on some of the things that you've been truthful, you and Mary both, over the years, yep. you have always had my best interest at heart. Yeah. And even though there's a lot of fear in me about hearing it, yeah. I want to know. Have you given much analysis to time to analyse why you have so much fear about hearing it? When I have pondered that question, yeah. I'm afraid that all of the things that I think that are bad about myself, I'm going to be confirmed. Right. Right. And so there's this part of me that just doesn't want to know whether that's true or not. Right. And then it usually when I talk to God about that, I'm showing something different. Yeah. But I don't engage the process enough to trust that my false beliefs aren't my reality. So can you see this fear is sort of like, in a way, pushing away truth all the time, just rejecting, rejecting truth. Yeah. yeah. So you can see that. Yeah. And you can see that if you wanted to help somebody else to accept truth, while you've got a fear of accepting it yourself, I can, can't. You, can you see that they're not going to have much of a help to actually accept truth either? Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. And good. and we and I find that we then tell each other things that are nice to hear. Of course, of course. <laughs> and dance everyone's around going, it. Don't tell me anything other than that. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you tell me something other than that, I'll, I'll be afraid or I'll cry or well, whatever you don't want to do, right? Yeah. Any other comments? What was your name? Carmel. Carmel, that's right. Um, I, exactly the same. Yeah. Um, I've been talking to Kerry and Paige. Yeah. And um, they've talked about how you're almost at one with God and that once you do that, that um, you'll then move very quickly to the 36th sphere. Yeah. And I just... I'm kicking myself because I keep not wanting to have a conversation with you. Yeah. And you can feel the reason why, why conversation is difficult? It's probably the same until a lot has happened in the last 10 days. Yeah. yeah. And I guess I wasn't really ready to want to hear the truth. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you. Oh, sorry, you want to go first? Yeah. I, I just um, come today to be exposed yeah. um, and um, and not avoid living the lie that I've been living. Yeah. And I feel really, really nervous. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Do you know why you feel nervous? Um, not really. I, I, it just closes me down that much that I, I don't know how to feel in that. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, I've tried so hard this last fortnight to um, do what's been suggested by the group for yeah. me to do yeah. and I've struggled just so much. I'm doing it every day, trying to write things down and, yeah. and follow what I know that I 
can do, but yeah. I just cannot do it. Yeah. So um, the emotions that it's been bringing up is all about failure and and um, not being good enough. Yeah. Um, uh, and I just don't know where to go with it from there. Yeah. Okay. And I feel really, really um, uneasy uh, in myself, you know, and it switches me down from hearing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think that's about as far as I can go. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, thank you. Um, I feel I feel excited yeah. as well as nervous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between those two feelings. <laughs> uh, I see it as a, as an opportunity for myself. Yeah. Um, as a because I, I have a desire to grow. Yeah. Um, I'm feeling more and more of my my true condition and um, and where I'm at and really realizing that I really need all the help I can get yeah. and um, and accepting your your condition uh, being uh, greater much greater in love than myself. Why do you accept that? Um, because you have you have expressed uh, love and truth uh, uh, that I haven't been able to. Yeah. Because of my addictions and so forth, right. and so um, I see that you're someone who can actually help help me overcome my well, expose my addictions, yep. and help me to to grow in my desire for for more love and truth. Right, okay. and um, and I and my own desires, to what I have at the moment regarding the center and yep. and helping other people, and and um, I just feel that. And I don't want to hurt other people. I don't want to damage other people. <laughs> yeah. And um, and I just want to take any opportunity I can to um, to help heal myself. Yeah. That's unloving, so that yeah. I don't hit, hurt other people. Yeah. So thank you. Nice. And Tony, did you want to add something to what I think I was saying? No, no. 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 <laughs> um, for myself. If I'm going to be a leader of this group, I um, just feel a great responsibility to find out things like um, obviously you can see conditions of love better than we can see our own. And um, for you to point out things that I can't see is really going to be beneficial for the group. I want to discuss that point with you in the future because, uh, you know, so if we can remember that, maybe Mary can just note that down for me because I don't feel, feel that that's necessarily what all of the people in the group actually feel, but, mm. but I've, I know you personally feel that. Mm. Um, while you're talking, I was just wondering if you could just revise the, the general guidelines that you gave, was it a week ago? That yeah, the principles of um, just very short ones. Yeah, just mm. so that the ones who weren't <coughs> at that meeting mm. uh, can be reminded of that today before we proceed. Yeah, the, um, even this meeting reminds me of how it's done in the spirit world. Yeah. Like it's, um, it's addressing things straight away, if we're let, not letting them go further and the people that are in love won't participate or keep um, help the person stay in addiction, they'll stop them yeah. or walk away. Yeah. And that's what I feel, this is like today, I feel really grateful. Like yeah. that's really cool because yeah. no other group started like this. Yeah. So it's a great opportunity. Yeah. Um, but the... Maybe it's because everyone's too nervous to do it to start anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing them again, you reckon, <laughs> after today. Uh, just the principle of love is the biggest one I find um, to heal through love and through divine love, not just natural love. Yeah. And it's got the greatest healing power, yeah. not any modality as such, but the love itself, no matter yeah. how it's done. It's just even talking to someone on the street is it as well. Yeah. And um, for this group, um, it's essential that we stay in the same way is that you get to God and that's the love I'm aiming for too. Yeah. That we use the same principles to get there with this group and that's through love, humility and truth. And I want those to be adhered to really strongly because that's the only way, to, there's only one way to get there. Yeah. And I'd like to do those and, and the same principles too, just like in the spirit world, if you if there's anger or resentment or anything, that's just not on, it's not going to accept it in this group. Yeah. So what, like, I want this to be a place where you're loved as well. Yeah. The people that come here, I want to pr like protect them, I guess, in that way. Yeah. I won't accept anything that's not in those principles. So. Yeah, it's a very good goal. Mm -hmm. And in fact, for any group to work, they really need to have these particular goals. So mm. it, there are a lot of sort of like divine truth groups that get started around the world 
But because they don't have that underlying goal or principle, they always finish up disbanding mm. because there's nobody who adheres to those particular principles and who makes sure that those particular principles are always engaged in the group, mm. particularly when they themselves are challenged. Yeah. You know, so you often have a leader of a group set up a group and then when they themselves get challenged, all of the so-called good principles go out the window <laughs> and in that moment they're the one who's angry and upset and, mm. and as a result of that, the group eventually disbands and that's why groups get set up disband, other groups get set up, they disband, and, and this constant process is something that needs to be addressed. And the only way it can be addressed is by basically there's underlying principles me. that you've given to your group. Yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, so that's really good. Yeah. Um, Sam? Um, you were going to say something, but I was just going to... Fire away. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> um, during the week... Um, with the engagements between yourself and um, also a little bit with Corny as well. Um, I guess I've realised for the first time on this path that I haven't actually even begun to understand what humility really is. Yeah. And um, just, I guess, this uh, huge incongruency between what um, I am actually feeling from moment to moment and what... I like to believe I'm feeling, yep. you know, like just yeah. really getting that for the first time, I guess. Yeah, that's very good. Um, and I was just reflecting this morning on uh, quite a number of my addictions that have been exposed this week and um, one of them, I guess, is around like so desperately wanting to feel like I'm a good person yeah. Yeah. and um, that I have good intentions and all of that. Yeah. And... It's prevented me from really seeing how much I damage other people, yeah. you know, and yeah. that for me is the biggest thing that I want to really start to change. Yeah, because if you're, if you're working with people and many of you, the reason why you've been invited initially to the group and I feel the group will grow as you recognise other people who w would like to join you. And the main reason why you've been attracted to the group in the first instance is because you feel like you'd like to be involved in healing the soul, basically, and heal the healing process. And that there is a feeling inside of you, a passion inside of you for that to occur. But it really needs to be done with purity. But before we discuss that, what I'd like to do is put one question to you. Um, that, that is something that you do need to address uh, and answer within yourself, and that is this. I only know of two people here who actually believe that I'm Jesus. All right. And that's Corny and Mary. And the only reason why they really believe I'm Jesus is because they've had <laughs> 2,000 years of life with me, so they know that I am. And so the reason why I'm here is not because I'm Jesus in this group at this point. The, and none of you could actually say you're here to listen to what Jesus has to say about something in this group because you've yet to resolve the question as to who I am. So that, and I'm not saying you have to resolve that question. What I'm just saying is you, you've yet to resolve it. So let's put that aside for a moment. <coughs> Why are you prepared to listen to me for a couple of hours is the question that you've got to ask yourself. Bearing in mind that you haven't resolved the issue of who I am, there's got to be another reason why you're willing to put aside a couple of hours of your time to listen to somebody who you're pretty much unsure of at this point still. So what's that, <laughs> Simon? Uh, the main reason why for me is I don't feel judgment from you yep. and that's the biggest fear I have whenever I see you is that you don't judge me. Yep. Um, I feel comfortable with most other people in the group other than like yourself mainly, like just because of that, that feeling that you don't judge me and that's, that scares the pants off me really. Why does it scare you? Um, well, I... Uh, for me, I suppose it gets back to core feelings around that I, I deserve it and if I don't have that feeling coming at me, then I don't feel um, accepted by others and loved by others at some level. So it's level. almost like you need judgment in order to be accepted. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I agree, there's a lot of that that goes on in groups normally. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Jane? My spirit friend, or my spirit friends, my guides have, um, have said that you're Jesus, so... Yeah, they know who I am. 
So, um... <laughs> yeah, so that's what I'm here, yeah, wanting to work on that. Yeah. To discover your identity. Yeah. Okay. And what you're teaching, so... So you're really trusting your guide as to one of the reasons why you're here listening. Yeah, in, and in moments I have felt their love, like I've just felt it, yeah. so their love, so <coughs> they've said that... Jesus, how can I deny that when I've felt their love? So you, you, it's sort of an issue that you've come to trust your guides and uh, as a result of that feel like when they suggest you should listen to somebody that it's worth, uh, you're probably worth listening to. Yeah. Yep, that's probably worth listening to. Yep. Yeah, Hento? I mean, I share the same same sort of principles as Jane on yeah. that because yeah. um, I rely heavily on what I've received yeah. from, from the spirits. But the openness I'm feeling, the first time I've actually started to explore who I really am yeah. was when you actually told me at the dinner table, you're arrogant, and it didn't just <laughs> wash off me. It, yeah. it was the first time where, you know, the thought process started to... To kick in. To kick in. Yeah. And... Um, and I feel with myself, um, it's it's the ongoing openness to it. It's it's like um, you've got this relenting love and without judgment and you always give me that yeah. gift and it's taken a long time for me to start to sink in and I kind of feel like only now I'm attempting to reflect a lot more yeah. about my life and yeah. and um, who I really am. And, yeah. and this group is like I get this inner yearning in the last couple of weeks yeah. with this group. And yeah. I know it took me a while to get there. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, it's just there's this feeling that comes with it. Yeah. And and yeah. Um, to be open, to be able to start to explore and yeah. um, and expose, you know, the things that are within me. And so, and I feel that's every time I meet you, it's just um, there's another truth that's out there. I, all right, there's an, <laughs> add that to my list and <laughs> one day you'll come to it. But yeah. at the same time, six months later, I actually remember that as truth and I actually sincerely felt that what you told me at that time was actually truth and I'm, then I look it back and I go okay I've got another hundred things left yeah. on the list but I don't know it's confirmed and reconfirmed for myself the truth that you've given me yeah. and I rely on that. Yeah. yeah. Can, I, can I just say before we continue you're still getting you're still quite used to blowing smoke up your ass really <laughs> to be frank. Like, and um, and that is an issue that you face as a group, uh, and it's an issue that you're going to face with with other people that you try to assist. Because if all you want to do is make them feel good about themselves or agree with them, then then can you see that's really not sharing what you really feel? Because some of you don't feel any of the feelings you're actually saying. Not all of you, but some of you don't feel the actual feelings you're saying. One of the reasons why you're nervous is because you don't actually feel the feelings you're saying. Because why, why would you be nervous with a person who has no judgment and who feels love for you and care, compassion for you and, but is also truthful and direct with you? Why would you feel nervous with such a person? If you truly felt that they cared about you and loved you, would you feel nervous, do you think? Yes. No. If you really believe. If you really believed it in your heart, you wouldn't, would you? If you really felt in your heart that the person cared about you and loved you, you wouldn't be nervous in their company, would you? Yeah. So what, what does that tell us? We're still not sure that you care about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we use the mic, yeah, yeah, so, um, so, so for Nat, what does that tell, tell you? <laughs> for me personally, that I'm still not sure that you are all that you say that you are and that the things that you say directly to me are because you care. And how long have we known each other? Four years. Okay, so in four years you still haven't resolved that question. Yeah. Can you see that's a bit of a problem in itself? Yeah. yeah. So, so the reality is that one of the reasons why you're so nervous is because you are, you are, you, you don't really believe that, that I have your best interests at heart and that I love you and care about you and that I tell you the truth just for the, just for the sake of you being able to be, have the gift of hearing it. So, so that being the case... Um, why are they here? Why are we here? <laughs> when I read your email after I emailed the group, yep. in the very last little bit of your email, you 
it stirred up heaps in me. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I had to read it three or four times <laughs> before I could yeah. actually really start to feel through each individual thing that you were pointing out for yeah. me personally and yep. as a group. But the bit that got me the most was when you said, we have an opportunity to refine ourselves and our relationship with God. Yeah. And it brought up so much sadness and I just didn't want to miss that opportunity. Yeah. And I realised that as much as there is only a small part of me that wants that because I spend my life in addiction trying to avoid yeah. exactly that, yeah. when you put it to me, that's how it is. <laughs> you can either have it or not. Yeah. I, went, I don't want... I, don't, I want it. I don't yeah. want to not have it. So there is this, uh, shall we call it a growing desire? Yes. <laughs> to, to develop some kind of a relationship with God. At this stage, there's not a, uh, an idea really of what that's going to turn into because you, you can't have an idea about something you've never done before. Does that make sense? Yes. And so, so no matter what I tell you about your relationship with God, you can't have an idea of what it will turn out to be until you've actually gone through the process of developing a relationship with God and it turns out to be something. <laughs> and it, it, it confronts in me how much I do not trust love yep. and God's love I've experienced. You know, I've had those moments, yes. but it's still not enough. And I had that conversation with you, you know, so many months ago where you said to me, that's the problem that you and God isn't enough. And I pondered that for ages because I, I didn't get what you meant when you said it, but I realised that it's I don't even trust God's love. No. I don't trust any concept of love but even God's love. Exactly. And, I've, and I've had the experience of how pure and beautiful it is and I still don't trust it. Exactly, exactly. And that is a problem if you're following the divine love path. Well, it's a problem <laughs> if you want a relationship with God too <laughs> of discovery. Well, the reality is what is the divine love path all about? If you could define, let me, let me make it even more simple for you. What are two things you need and the one thing God will give in the divine love path? Love. So, love. Sam? Um. So what's the one thing God gives? Uh, God can, well, God can give us the humility that we need to yeah. Even more important to, than that, though. Um, truth. Even more important than that. And love. <laughs> exactly. Like the one thing we're really seeking for is love, isn't it? Truth, we know that we're going to have to enter a state of truth to have the reception of love and a state of humility. But in the end, it's the desire for God's love, isn't it? Then, and the fact that God's willing to give it. Uh, that's the really key part. Now, for God to give it, what needs to happen inside of us? Well, we've got to want it, but what do you call that? What do you call wanting God's love? What do you call that? Love. If we have, give it one word. Love. Even a, word, a more popular word than that. Prayer. Prayer. <laughs> prayer. So prayer on your part is so essential in your relationship with God. Now, I still feel, even, even with that word, you still have so many, like, Addictions about that single word and, and fears about that single word, prayer, because it reminds you of, you know, Christian faith or what you've heard about Christian faith and, and all of these other things. And, and as a result of that, many of you don't engage in prayer. Right? Now, how can you have a relationship with God when one of the first things you need in order to establish this relationship is prayer? Can you see it's impossible? Like... And many of you are focused on healing yourselves at this stage, but you're doing it without God. You're doing it without prayer. So that's called self-reliance. And self-reliance means that you're going to have to develop yourself in natural love and you're going to have to go through the traumatic process of doing it through the process of the law of compensation. And that's going to take forever. Or for many of it, it won't take forever, of course, but it might take a long time in comparison <laughs> Add to your life on earth. And, uh, and for many of you, it is taking a long time. Many of you have known about the divine truth now four or five years. And to be honest with you, you still don't engage in prayer on a daily or hourly basis, which is the primary way in order to grow towards God. Now, there's one other thing that you need besides prayer. And, and in fact, it's going to trigger you into prayer. It's going to help you want prayer. What's that, do you think? It's a quality. What do you think that quality might be? Really? 
Humility. Well, yes, but the humility doesn't generate a desire for God necessarily. Like a person can be humble without desiring God. But there's something that has to, a quality that has to be created that inside of ourselves that needs to be present before we'll pray, before we'll actually desire God, before we'll actually even believe that God's got any love to give us. Faith. Faith. Faith's, faith's the, the quality. Without faith, you're not going to pray. So if you believe, for example, and many of you believe this, right in your souls at the moment, you believe that God's never going to give you love. That's the belief that's inside of you. You've been told differently, but what you're told makes no difference. <laughs> All right? It's what you believe that ma ma matters. And if what you believe is that God doesn't love you and you're never going to get love from God, are you going to pray? Probably not, right? You're probably going to use some other form of trying to heal yourself other than prayer. Right? But prayer has this effect on your soul of opening it to divine love. Without prayer, without the longings that come from your soul towards God to receive love, your heart cannot be open towards God and therefore divine love can't flow into it. So the problem is that we need prayer in order to have a relationship and establish a relationship with God. And before we will pray, we need some faith. Because if we have no faith that a relationship with God cannot be established, then prayer won't even happen. And this is why prayer doesn't happen for most of you. Does that make sense? That's why it doesn't happen on a consistent basis, why there's not a pure longing inside of your soul for God's love yet, because you don't believe at this point in time that God actually loves you or that God's got love to give you or that you're worthy to receive God's love. Or, and, and we could list many <laughs> beliefs that we currently have that cause us to repel the concept that God wants to give us some love, right? Now, the reason why I bring that up for the group is that for, for you to truly be able to assist other people in the process of healing and truly be able to assist other people in the process of healing the planet that we're living on, as well as the people that are living on it, then you've got to understand the source of all healing. Now, the source of all healing ultimately is God. And in particular, God's love is the source of all healing. Now, if you're not experiencing that love in your personal day-to-day -day life, can you see that it's going to be very, very difficult for you as a group to actually engage God's love as the healing modality, if you like. And so what you're going to do is you're going to choose other ways of healing. And this is why you've become addicted to other ways of healing. Does that make sense? whether it be energy work on the spirit body, whether it be, um, you know, helping people with mediumship, whether it be iridology for Sam, whether it, whether it be, you know, um, the laying on of hands, should we call it that, on the body, whether it could be called mind-body therapy or whatever other therapies you would like to list. And if we were doctor, we could even add all those therapies like medication and all these other kinds of things. Why are they all created? They're all created because we're in the denial of the greatest healing tool. That's why they're all created. And when we deny the greatest healing tool, we come up with substitutes in order to heal. Does that make sense? And instead of using the greatest healing tool on the planet, and, it, and to be honest, it hasn't been used since the first century, and it wasn't just me who used it in the first century. Most of my followers after my passing used it in the first century until they died and then it sort of it grew out of existence like because of some reasons which we'll discuss but it, it sort of went out of existence where very little healing was done now there's been sporadic healing since then from people who have a relationship with God through that main modality and then there's been all this other type of healing which we call, let's call it uh, well we could basically call it all of the types of healing that are available to you on the natural love path and of that, you could classify all of the he healing that is available to you through any New Age practices. You could also add all of the healings that are available to you through the practice of religion. You could add to that all of the healings that are available through spirit relationships. So that's all the healing from the natural love path, if you like. And then we've got this really powerful healing, which hasn't really been on the planet for 2,000 years, uh, which we could start to engage. But we don't want to engage because... 
we have all these false beliefs about the actual modality itself, and that is we are not engaged in prayer, we are not engaged in faith, and we, as a result, do not have a longing for God's love to enter our soul. And as a result of that, we spend most of our days in frustration or trying to find some other way of healing. <laughs> That's what we do. And, and I feel, from, for the group, if you continue to do that, then the group will benefit you very little at all. Does that make sense? Now, if that's the case, if, if prayer is the underlying thing that we need to develop ourselves and for, for to be a good healer, and we need to firstly have some faith that God wants to love us and that God wants to express her love to us and, and help us feel her love, and that if I am asking for God's love and I don't feel like I'm receiving it, that it's got to be something to do with me. You see, if I don't have the faith that God wants to give the love, then I'll start thinking that it's something to do with God. <laughs> it's God's fault that I'm not getting loved, right? There's something wrong with God's laws. That's the reason why I'm not getting loved. Or God doesn't bend her will towards me and God should. You know, that's why I'm not getting loved. Or whatever other reasons we may come up with. If we understand those three basic principles, and this is why Solomon in the, in the pageant messages said that the three greatest things that he could think of were firstly, the divine love that comes from the Father. Secondly, prayer. And, and thirdly, faith on the part of mortals. The divine love that comes from God changes you into a more loving person. The reason why I generally reflect love to you most of the time, even after I've been attacked by you many times, I still reflect love to you, is because there's enough love in my soul to allow that to occur. And that didn't come from me. It didn't come from my development. It came as a gift from God to me as a result of my two primary desires, which are, which are well, the desire for truth and the desire for God's love to enter me. And I had to have some faith that actually God wanted to give it. I had to develop faith over, the, over my years of life on earth in the first century and now. I had to develop faith in order to feel that God wanted to give it in order for me to engage that process. Does that make sense? Natalie? When you say faith, it stirs this feeling in me of having to trust and then it stirs another feeling of risk. <laughs> Well, yes, I, I agree. It does. Uh, faith and trust are very closely related emotions, and certainly there is a degree of risk. I agree. But let's assume for a moment that God created you. Okay. Right. Is, you think that's a valid assumption? Fairly, yeah. Fairly valid. Okay. Now, uh, many people would not agree with that, of course. <laughs> but uh, let's assume if if God loved, if God created you, and God created a pretty intricate organism in terms of even if God created just your body. Mankind at this point in time still does not understand the body and so and doesn't understand why we get diseases and why we get sick and why we grow old and why we die or all of those things. You know, these basic things that have been around for tens of thousands of years, right, in terms of human understanding, we still don't know the answers generally. You know, the majority of mankind doesn't know the answers. So if, and if we look at the complexity of your own body, can we state that God's an intelligent being? Yes. And, and surely intelligence and love go hand in hand. I didn't agree with that straight away when you said it, why? but I'd like to think so. <laughs> well, what, why wouldn't it? Well, you think about every organ in your body. Every single organ has a role. Everyone is supportive of the other organs in your body. Like, it's all... And God's obviously given you a lot of gift to experience things. And, and you know, for example, God's given you the gift to experience sexual pleasure. God's given the, the gift of man to experience love as a feeling, as an emotion. God's given you the ability to feel a lot of things. Now, now, all of those things require somebody who's in a state of love to give you these gifts. So we can naturally assume, surely, that God is a God of love. Or we can at least have a degree of faith that God is a God of love. Yeah. Right, so so for some of you, your prayer would probably be more along these lines. I don't know if you love me, 
I don't feel that you love me, but I know logically that you must have at least some love. <laughs> Otherwise, my body wouldn't be the way it is and, you know, the world around me, the beautiful things that I see in the world around me wouldn't be the way they are. So, so what I'm going to do is take a risk and trust and have some faith in the fact that you probably do have some love to give and start your relationship with God that way. For many of you, you haven't even begun doing that yet. You haven't begun being honest with God about what you truly feel in the relationship. I feel really sad just hearing you say, I'm going to take the risk. Yeah, yeah. And that's caused you to not want to take the risk. And so what you do is you spend most of your time engaging with spirits instead. Now, it's far more risky engaging with spirits than it is engaging with God, if you think about it, from a logical perspective. Because those spirits will have a varying degrees of, uh, of love. Some of them will be quite dark. Some of them will come along and masquerade, right, which is something that God doesn't do, but, but which they may attempt to do, masquerade as, a, as angels of light, as the Bible says, or masquerade as a person who has your best interests at heart, who doesn't really have your best interests at heart, because they just want to suck the lifeblood out of you through your addictions. And you are attracting many of those kind of spirits as a result. But you prefer a relationship with these people. And in fact, what I'm saying in that applies to all of you at this point in time. You prefer relationships with spirits over your relationship with God. Why? Why? Yes, it makes no logical sense to do when that, you, does it? When you say it like that, no, it doesn't. No. And I don't have an answer for myself at this point. <laughs> well, there, there can only be one reason why. Because it makes no logical sense to do it. It makes no logical sense to trust people who potentially may be untrustworthy, for example. It makes no logical sense. So there's only one reason why you'd do it. Well, I'm, the feeling I have when you say that is that I'm getting something out of it. Exactly. Which... You're, getting, you're getting some addictions met through the process that you're unwilling to give up. Yeah. That's the only reason why it would happen. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. <laughs> you wanted to say something? Oh, I was just thinking about why everyone is so afraid around you and that's because you don't meet addictions. No. So even if they're like compelled by the fact that there's truth and love, most people get very afraid because you're not engaging in addictions and that's similar to what Simon said at the beginning, that's how we all feel secure and lo loved and it's actually not true. Yeah. You're, you're used to getting your addictions met. And when somebody meets your addictions, you view that as love. That's part of the issue. You're viewing it as love even when it's not. Now, now God doesn't meet your addictions. That's why many of you believe God doesn't love you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Many of you believe God does not love you because God at this moment, right this moment in time, is not meeting your addictions. When other people are meeting your addictions, so, and so you <coughs> feel they love you more. You, f they, you feel they care for you more. Right? But if we define love and we have some faith in God's definition of love, then we would have to ask ourselves, okay, I'm not receiving love from God at this moment. That means that obviously there's something in me blocking this process. If we have some faith that God wants to give you love all the time, which is, I know to, which is what I know to be God's desire, but which you as yet understand, if we have some faith that that is what God wants, then can you see we would have a very, very strong desire to receive that from God that would begin to develop. We'd have some faith that God will give it to us. And if we have some faith that God will give it to us, then we probably will engage in prayer. Right? We probably will if we had some faith. The reason why we're not engaging in prayer is because we don't have much faith. <laughs> and the reason why we don't have much faith is because we have a whole set of beliefs inside of us that tell us that if somebody doesn't meet your addiction, that it means they don't love you. Right? So we believe that if they meet our addictions, they love us. And if they don't meet our addictions, they don't love us. That's what we believe. Now, God doesn't meet our addiction, so we don't feel any love coming from God or what we define as love coming from God. And we are totally blocked to receiving what really could come from God 
because we don't even have enough faith to trust that God is a God of love who wants to give us love and all we need to do is pray from our hearts to receive it. We don't even have that faith. And after that point, everything we do for self-improvement has to be based on self-reliance. Right? And this is the danger of any healing group, is that you become frustrated with your relationship with God because you're not receiving love from God or you can't feel it or you can't even know that you are. And as a result, a result of that frustration, you turn to the other forms of healing which you can feel some benefit from. Right? Whether that be, and in most cases that involves spirits, of course, meeting your addictions. So of course you feel like you're being loved or something is changing under those circumstances. And the primary problem with a group based like that is that the one core belief that addictions equals love is never challenged. So even the people that you go to do therapy or healing on, you're going to feel, I have to meet their addictions in order to love them. And if you don't meet their addictions, you'll feel like, I'm not loving this person. And, you know, it gets really confusing because you're not in your relationship with God challenging the false belief that addictions equals love. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, I'm fine, yeah. Um, what I find working with the children is that I'm just trying to understand, like, I don't feel they... I, I feel like I can do that with children where I can stand in, a, in more of a love-based mm -hmm. where no matter what they throw at me, you would say. Mm -hmm. But... I suppose I feel there's less judgment from them, I suppose, is where, where with the adults I would struggle to really stand in that space, especially if they're quite angry. Like where they're... It doesn't more... actually matter what's coming from the adult. Yeah. What matters is your response to what's coming from the adult. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, so for example, an adult can be ready to project <coughs> rage at you, but if you don't connect to their rage in any way inside of yourself and you don't feel bad about yourself when they're in a rage with you, it'll have no effect on you. It only has an effect on you because there are some beliefs inside of yourself yeah. that it connects with. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, with, a, with dealing with children, because you're an adult and you think of them as children, when they're in a rage with you, you, you are distant from their rage emotionally. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're distant from their judgment, even if they have it. Yeah. You're distant because they are a child and you're an adult. Okay. So you sort of have a way of almost going, it's almost like feeling in that moment, like you're above what they're, what they're relating to you. What they're doing. Yeah. Does that make sense? And as a result of that, it doesn't connect to your heart and hurt you. Right? Some did at the start, but I don't feel it so much anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas if an adult said exactly the same thing to you, how would you feel? Well, some of the things that they said to me, I'd be pretty scared. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Can you see how it, when an adult reflects something back to us like that, it, it connects with whatever is going on inside of us much more strongly. And as a yeah. result of that, that's why we have a response. Yeah. yeah. And this is one reason why we then feed, go into the addiction with the adult, where we, we might not go into it with the child. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. uh, when we go into the addiction with the adult, we're basically saying, I want you to feel differently about me. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some action, whether that's giving them a feeling of some kind, a projection of some kind, or, or taking some physical action. I'm going to do something so that I can get back your approval and acceptance. Even if that means compromising all of God's laws, compromising love, compromising truth, compromising how I really feel, everything. Oh, I'll be willing to throw all those principles out the window in that moment and just engage in the addiction so that, so that I can get back to feel good about myself again. That's the power of your addiction. You need to stop seeing it as the other person's projection. You need to start seeing it as the result of your own addiction. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying with that? Stop, you need to stop seeing the feeling that's getting projected you and your willingness to compromise as their problem. You need to start seeing it as your own problem. While you honour their 
feelings about you more than you want a, the relationship with God, more than you want a relationship with truth, more than you want your desire to receive love from God, more that you honour yourself, then while you're honouring them and their feelings about you more than the, all these other things, you are going to compromise. You're definitely going to compromise God's laws. Each of you are compromising on God's laws many, many times in a single day as a result of that. Now, you can't ever become at one with God by compromising God's laws and principles. You, you, if you want to become at one with God, you're going to have to eventually honour God's law as much so much that, that you become at one with God. Right? In other words, you honour God's laws as much as God honours God's laws, if you like. You can see the benefit of those laws. Yeah. So then to challenge that, if someone's projecting something at you and you're, you own, you just sit with the feeling of what it's creating in you instead of... I'm it's trying to not, work out how you how do you challenge that. Then? I think the point that he's making is that it's they're not creating it in you; it's already in you. Yeah, it's already so an error inside of you. And even your question is is proof that you don't understand, understand what I just said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, okay, I'm still not getting that. It's it's a, an injury in love that's already inside of you, and all all that has to change is the conditions, and there it is triggered. But it's inside of you. It's inside of you. You're carrying it around every moment of every day of every you know every hour of your life. You're carrying this around until it's released from you. So any law of attraction event could potentially expose the error that's in me. They will. All of the law of attraction events have been designed by God to expose every error within you. God. This is why God created the law of attraction that operates upon the soul, so that the error within you can be exposed, and also so all the goodness in you can be reflected back at you so that, so, that, so that you can know when you're in harmony and out of harmony with the law. You see, you, if you think of God's laws as the framework of the universe in which you exist, and they are the framework of the universe in which you exist, every single one of these laws has been created through God's love. God, every, so every one of these laws has, has a loving operation, not an unloving one. Every single law, including the law of attraction, is a loving law that God has created in order for you to see two things. Two things. The first thing that it's helping you see is when you're in harmony with the law. And the second thing it helps you see is when you're out of harmony with the law. Does that make sense? Now, when you're out of harmony with the law, pain is always created. Pain and suffering in your soul is always created when you're out of harmony with the law. When you're in harmony with the law, Joy and peace and, and love and other qualities such as those are all created. This is the aspect of us living the law. Many of you have no desire to live the law. You're still in rebellion. You still want to rebel every single moment, many of you. Just as you law. were saying that, I don't often see the joy and the peaceful. You know, it's there sometimes, but in contrast to how much of the pain and error... Well, the reason why you don't see the joy in the peaceful is because most of the time you're trying to break the law. And of course, when you most of the time try to break the law, all you're going to feel is the pain and suffering that the law has as a penalty when you break it. And if you've become sensitive emotionally, which many of you have now become more and more sensitive emotionally, you're going to feel that more and more. <laughs> right? You'll feel more and more the results of breaking the law. Now, why is it that most of the time you meet me, I don't seem to be in a like terrible shape or crying mess. Why is it I seem happy most of the time? Because you're in harmony with the law. Because I don't break as many laws as you do. <laughs> Does that mean? <make> <laughs> it's a simple thing. I don't break as many laws as you do and therefore I feel the results of the joy and peace and harmony that comes from not breaking as many laws as you do. Do you understand? I just need to write that down. <laughs> but I still like breaking the law a lot. Yeah. And, and the reality is that each of us here need to be self-reflective, you see. We, we like to break the law, and then what we want to do is have something come along and fix the penalty that the law itself has imposed. Now, now that's not very logical either, if you think about it. God is unchangeable. All of God's laws are unchangeable. So, so can you see that if I break the law, there will be a natural penalty every single time. What you sow, you reap. You, there's going to be a natural penalty every time. 
if you're reaping pain in your day-to-day -day life, and many of you still are reaping large amounts of pain in your day-to-day -day life, it's because you're breaking the law quite frequently. And many of you have yet to see the relationship between my pain, the law being broken, my pain, the law being broken. Does that make sense? Now, if you can't see that, how are you ever going to help another person see it? Why not? No. Now, so far I've brought up like two or three basic things about the divine love path, if you want to call it, the way. Right? Two or three basic things that if you were practicing them, you would feel very different in your day-to-day -day life. You would feel God's love entering you, so you'd be happier. You'd, you'd be in harmony with more of God's laws, and so you'd naturally not have the consequences that are negative. You'd have more positive consequences for following them. You'd feel the ben positive, beneficial consequences of following the law rather than the negative um, pain and suffering that results from breaking it. Right? And as a result of that, you'd be much happier in your day-to-day -day life. And so what kind of emotions would you be experiencing then? Joy. Joy and happiness and peace and other emotions. Now, now many of you say, oh, I don't like this divine love path, you know, because all I ever seem to feel is pain and pain and more pain and more pain. Well, I understand completely why you don't like it. Because you're breaking the law so frequently and you've now become sensitive to the consequences. And of course you're not going to like it. But you still don't want to give up breaking the law for some reason. Right? Now, if you don't do that, how can anyone you help do it? And this is where it, it can, you can see in the end, if you want to help another person, one of the best ways you can do this is by understanding the basic principles in your heart first for yourself. <clears throat> Does that make sense? So if we look at a healing group and what the healing group would do, we can see that the first object of the healing group would be to focus on healing amongst themselves the particular things that prevent them from desiring prayer, from desiring faith, and from being self-reflective and, and, and wanting to break the law all the time. Right? Can you see that? Like That would be the most beneficial operation of the group, first off, wouldn't it? Yeah, yep. makes sense. And in that process, your addictions would be exposed. And remember, every one of your addictions are beliefs about love that are false. And each time that you want an addiction met, it's because you believe something about love that's not true. Now, under those circumstances, God is never going to feed these addictions. God's never going to help you satisfy them. And so you don't feel anything from God. And then you go... I don't feel anything from God. I don't even know if this divine love path is true. I don't ever feel any God's love when I really want, want God's love. And, and we tell ourselves all these stories as a result, and then we don't even have the effort to even pray as a result. And we don't understand that it's all coming from this underlying problem, the underlying problem of faith and prayer not existing, and the underlying problem driving that of our addictions driving our entire life. And all of our addictions are false beliefs about love that we have. Um, I guess I've been um, feeling or blaming my rebelliousness on my childhood. Mm. And I'm realising that that's not where it's no, coming from correct. at all. You're it's, dead right. It's, it's not about your childhood. It's about arrogance. It's, like this, it's, it's arrogance, isn't it? It, it is. It is. You see, let's look at the, sincerely what's happening with our childhood experience. If we look at it, God created our pristine soul. Let's call that the real self. And God, God then, through this process of incarnation, we incarnated onto this planet. Now, unfortunately, due to history, many people before us have chosen to walk away from God and they've chosen to break God's laws. And as a result of that, they have all these beliefs inside of their soul that caused them to, that, that are all, and, and a lot of the penalties that, that result from breaking of the law inside of their soul. When we are incarnate, we start absorbing these same feelings, these same motivations, these same emotions. Let's call that the injured self. And then what happens as we grow up, we uh, want to deny the injured self. And so what we do is we create a facade. So we call that I've called that to you in previous talks, the facade self. 
So we've created this facade. And we don't want to give up the facade. Right? Because to give up the facade, all of the injuries would be felt. And we don't want to feel all of our injuries. That's because of our lack of humility. We don't want to feel all of our injuries. But it's the only way through our injuries and into our real self. So what we try to do is we try to skip over the injuries by creating a facade. Now, who created the facade? We did. We did. We did. And, and who's holding on to the facade? We are. I am. We are. And that is a choice that we're making. Now, that, it, that choice to rebel against law, while it might have been assisted by your environment, it's certainly not your environment's fault. You could choose to not rebel against law. It's like having 500 mates, right? And all of them want to break a certain law. Let's, call, let's say this, the law of how fast you're driving on a road, you know, just the spe speeding laws. Now, if you're surrounded by a heap of mates who want to break the law, I agree that it is a bit harder right, for you to not break that law. But it's not impossible. All you've got to do is disagree <laughs> and say, no, I'm not going to break the law. It's just a choice, a decision, exercised by your will. That's all it is. So what we've got to start seeing is that our rebellion is not the result of the injuries that we have. It is the result of our desire to rebel, our desire to get away from the law, our desire to remain in a facade. That is what is driving our rebellion. It's not. We can't blame it on our parents. We can't blame our rebellion on our parents. And God, in fact, does not attribute your rebellion to your parents. That's why the penalties of the laws are there. Yep. Otherwise, the penalty of every time you broke a law, it would be attributed to one of your parents. Uh, not to you. But that's not how God works. The reason why is quite obvious if you think about it. It is our choice to rebel. We're the one making the choice. No matter how much fear is within us, no matter how many injuries are within us, we can choose to not rebel. That's the only way we're going to heal any injuries, actually. Mm. And our desire to continuously rebel is the problem. That's the desire that we've got to examine. So one of the things I wanted to talk about with you today was, was the underlying real desires that are present within you, not the ones you'd like to believe that are present within you. Because, because what I see most people doing when it comes to creating a group of any kind for any purpose is they have very little idea of what is actually within them in that moment that caused them to create the attraction of the group. And as a result of not knowing, they make choices and decisions based around their addictions rather than based around what the truth was. So if we examine this particular situation with regard to healing, can I say categorically, or at least for the majority of you present, that prayer is not a day-to-day -day activity? Is that true? As I've described it in this discussion. Right? Lily? Yeah. You defined it as longing for divine love or just talking to God? Um, both, but also as having a feeling of faith that you're going to receive love under the desire. You, you actually do desire it. Not, not you're going, oh, I don't really believe that God's going to give me any. I don't really believe that God really wants to care about me. I don't really feel divine love entering my heart. See, if we're not feeling divine love entering us, then there's a high likelihood that we actually don't have a sincere desire for it. Does that okay. make sense? Yep. And it's the sincere desire for it that's going to have it enter us. So, so how many of you are feeling like every time you long for divine love, you're receiving some? Yeah. Well, when I really long for it, yeah. <laughs> when you really long for it. Yeah. So <laughs> that's the difference real. between really long... not very often. Exactly, exactly. When I really want to know God's truth about something, then I feel like there's love coming to me. Yeah. And, and um, there's emotions exposed. Well, I'm hoping because <laughs> it's emotional. And yeah, I'm, but and are I'm, you longing for God at the time? Yes. 
Right. Yes, there is a feeling from my heart. a lot of times heart. what many of you are getting are feelings from spirits. So you have a lot of friendly spirits around you uh, who obviously know about the divine truth. And whenever you have a thought of truth, they give you a feeling. Okay. Saying this is the way, they're trying to say to you, this is the way you need to go. Yeah. This is what you need to do. You need to think more about this particular issue. Can spirit still intervene then if the feeling in my heart is, um, I don't want to control it anymore, I just want, I want you to tell me God because I know you can tell me and I'm confused about whatever it is that's going on for me in the moment. Yeah. That's when I feel some love but I usually feel... But can you see how much of your addictions are involved in that request? And like I no. just... No, you can't. You can't see it. So when do, you, when do you want love? When do you want divine love? When I'm stuck. And when you're and lost in pain. And when I'm in pain. Yeah, that, that's an addiction. You're not receiving divine love when you're stuck and lost and in pain. You're receiving help from spirits when you're stuck and lost and in pain. Okay. Right? But you're not going to receive love from God because that's an addiction. You, you, want, you, want, you want God to come only when okay. you're in pain. If you truly had a desire for God that was sincere, would you only want God to come with you, to you while you're in pain? No. No, you want God to come to you all the time, would you not? Yeah. So, so the real test of whether you're in addiction or not is do you desire God all the time or do you only desire God when you feel lost and in pain? Because if you only desire God when you're lost and in pain, there's a high likelihood you're not receiving divine love in those moments but rather just receiving help from spirits, trying to help you through the reason why you're in pain. And what's the reason why you're in pain? Breaking the law. Because I'm breaking the law. Because you're breaking the law. (laughs) That you didn't know or maybe were unaware of or maybe purposefully broke. Who knows which one it was. And many times for us it's purposeful breakage of the law. That's the reason why we have the pain. And it's almost like this for many of us. What we do is we break the law, we break the law, break the law, then we start feeling the pain because we're sensitive to the pain, then we feel more pain because we... And we break the law again, we feel more pain, we break the law again. And eventually the pain of breaking the law is so great, we say to God, please come with your love so I don't have to feel this pain. Is God ever going to come to you under those circumstances? No. No, because the, the penalty of breaking the law is the pain and suffering you're now experiencing. Does that make sense? Yes. What we need to do is see the underlying reasons, and this is where the spirits with you are going. Yes, you need to be aware that you are in pain. Yes, you need to see that this pain has been created by something you chose to do that's out of harmony with love. And yes, we're willing to help you go through that. So I'll give you all these feelings telling you when you're on the right track. You know, they'll give you those same tingling sensations of. I, I'm on the right track now, I can feel that, you know, that feeling of, yeah, no, this is something that's important for me to follow through. And then you know what happens? As soon as that happens for most of us, we do a little bit down that track, we no longer feel as much pain, and you know what we do? We don't resolve the issue of why we break the law. And so what happens next? We break the law. We break the law. And then the pain starts increasing again. Bang, 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 bang. And then we go... Oh, I'm sick of this never-ending cycle on the divine love path. What? This is not a cycle of the divine love path. <laughs> this is a cycle of, of breaking your, the law. Yeah, <laughs> desire to break the law and receiving the subsequent penalties for doing so. That's what it's a cycle of. And now that you've become emotionally sensitive to the underlying result, you're going to feel it. Whereas before, when you're in complete denial, you didn't feel it as much. You would have felt it when you passed, of course. Perhaps, uh, perhaps after many years, you might have taken you to become sensitive, but now you've at least become sensitive to the pain. But this is the reason why the pain continues. Yeah? Thank you. Senko? Um, what about times when you realise you've broken the law and you've caused harm and you feel the, the, the pain of that and you long for, for God for forgiveness... Now God can do something. So that's not an addiction. No, that's not an addiction. But you also would then have to go back to, if you were truly sincere, you'd want to go back into, why did I break the law? Mm. What, why, what caused me to break the law again? Yeah. Now, if you were truly sincere, that's what you would do. So, so, so you might ask for God's forgiveness and be sincere in asking forgiveness. And in that moment, God forgives you, right? But... 
you also, if you really want to engage divine love to actually help you no longer break this law, you'd want to also have some more repentant processes that cause you to actually see the reason why you broke the law. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. That's where you'd want to go. Yeah. But certainly that is a better state than, than just breaking a law and crying out to God in your pain mm. without having any desire to fix any of the problems. Because uh, I've certainly had an addiction with God of feeling wanting to be rescued. Yeah, and God doesn't respond to that addiction, mm. of course, and so yeah. you never get rescued. No, no. <laughs> I realise that now. <laughs> 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 And the other thing I want to just mention was um, uh, just a, like my uh, just a small experience uh, as far as faith. Um, there have been times in my life where the faith grows and I can engage the process, and then uh, and then somehow it, it kind of it it, it kind, of, kind of comes to a stop and mm-hmm. it doesn't keep growing and growing. Or, or is it? And why is that? Do you feel? Well, addictions. I hit the addictions or fear. Well, you hit the addictions, and fear is just another addiction, by the way, for many of you. In other words, every time you hit fear, all you want to do is make your fear go away. Mm. Right? You don't want to actually resolve it or feel it. Right? Every time you hit a doubt, you just want it to go away. You don't want to resolve it and feel it so that it never comes back again. Right? And in that moment, of course, you stagnate in that place, and therefore, as you stagnate, now you've got the heaviness of your own doubts and your own fears... And then, of course, the spirits come in and they, they all on top of you now going, yeah, yeah, you know, there's no God. Why do you even believe in God? What's the point? There's yeah, no point to this. Feel, yeah. Right? And there's all these spirits come in. And before you know it, right, and these are all the results of choices that you're making, choices that are out of harmony with love. Right? Do you think the spirits would come in and influence you if you were making choices in harmony with love? How could they? No, they couldn't. They couldn't, right? So, so the choice out of harmony with love might be just quite simple. I'm not going to feel this particular fear or I'm not going to feel or try to resolve this particular doubt. Right? And so what happens? Straight away you're out of harmony with love, of yourself. Firstly, you're out of harmony with God's law of love about yourself. As soon as you're out of harmony with that, there are the instant penalties that come as a result of that are now on your soul as a result of being out of harmony with the law. And then on top of that, you're now attracting a whole group of spirits who want to manipulate that place to cause your degradation so that you go even further down the track of breaking the law. Yeah. Right? And, and so this is what, frequently what happens for many people who progress for a little while on the divine love path. They have all this stuff come up as a result and then they never address any of these issues and then they get piled on by certain groups of spirits, and it could be just a group of spirits who don't believe those believe the truth about divine love. Mm-hmm. You know, they might be just a group of natural love spirits who don't believe in God at all, for example. They might be a group of atheists who don't believe in God at all, and they just pile on top of you as well. But that is all part of this penalty, if you like, of not obeying the law of love towards yourself. Mm-hmm. Right? And this is what we've got to see. And uh, yeah, just uh, one of the things that helps us grow our faith and is acting in harmony with the law. And most of you have faith because you've experimented even just with the law of attraction and you've realised, oh, it really works. And so what I'm learning is the more I act in harmony with the law, the more my faith grows, which, you know, it, it builds on itself in a really positive way. Uh, a lot of us experience it going kind of negative, mm-hmm. as, as you've just explained, yeah. But in a way, that should even build your faith. Yeah. yeah. You know, once you know that there's... <laughs> there's the first time I've felt positive about pain in a while. If there's pain and suffering, suffering, I broke the law. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What law was it that Thanks I broke? Thanks for feedback. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what law? <laughs> that would make sense. You got... Do you think that most of us here have anger with God that we're not... So, don't want to look at it. Certainly. And one, that's one reason for our rebellion. Uh, one reason is we, we, we believe it's too hard. God made, has made it too hard. Too hard. Now, how many of you really feel that God's made it too hard? Right, really, most of you do. <laughs> and honestly, so that's God's anger. made it perfect, but, but you believe it's too hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's anger, yeah. I was shocked a couple of days ago. I watched some movies and 
this feeling come up that God is a freaking sadist. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Like full on. And I was like, yeah. yeah. The atrocities that goes on in this world, you know? I'm like, wow. Yeah. And this is, I know intellectually it's not God that's doing it, but the feeling. The feeling is. I need to release this. Yeah. And also, the feeling is that we prefer to blame somebody who's not going to blame us back, generally. Yeah. Like, we prefer to attack somebody who's not going to attack us back. Now, if you blamed, if you like, the people who created the badness, part, some of which is ourselves <laughs> in the world in which we live, rather than blame God, then of course there'd have to be some further actions. But it's easy to get away with blaming God as well. And many of us, as a result, revert to blaming God every single time something goes wrong. Not understanding that actually with every one of God's laws, there's all the beautiful results of living in harmony with them. Most of us completely ignore that. But we, we, we have no connection with that whatsoever, the majority of us. All we're focused on is, if I break the law, I'm going to have a penalty. I break the law, I'm going to have a penalty. That, that's all we're worried about, right? What, what penalty can I avoid here, right, is really what we're focused on. No, God's laws all have a positive outcome every time we live in harmony with them. That, it's beautiful every time we live in harmony with them. I get that totally. Yep. But that feeling... Exactly, the feeling needs is to there. Come out. So that feeling needs to come out. That's the key. And uh, I, I believe most people are not comfortable of going off at God. No, know? no, that's right. Most people are very afraid of going off at God because God might punish them because they believe that God is a God of wrath and yeah, punishment, yeah, yeah. and that you know sooner or later God's going to come down on a ton of bricks, you know, if they make a mistake. And so, and so, you'd be surprised how many people who have had no belief in God most of their existence still believe this humanity viewpoint, which has been passed down from generation to generation, which is that God is a God of wrath. Right? That's why atheists, most atheists become atheists, yeah, right. because they believe that God is a God of wrath. They don't go, no, the God of the Christians and the God of the Muslims is a God of wrath, but that's not real God. They don't do that. They actually believe that that God is the real God, if God exists. You know? and, and then, of course, they tell themselves, well, that God doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned, so no, there's no God. No, there is a God. It's just a, <laughs> a God of a different nature. Right? But there are these very long-standing human injuries that have been passed down from generation to generation. All of you have them. And you're going to have to get really honest with yourself to process them, to, to release them yeah, from yourself. I feel this is really important because for yeah. me, this is the block I feel. Well, how can you have a longing towards somebody who you believe it's does true. not have your best interests at heart and is a sadist in this case, right? <laughs> how can you ever have a longing for such a person? Exactly. So how will you ever pray every day with that feeling within you? Does that make sense? You're not. You can't. You're going to avoid it as a result. And, and if, if, if prayer brings divine love to your soul and divine love transforms your soul, how can you ever be transformed? You can't. Right? That's the reality. You can't be transformed except by doing it yourself, which is what we call the natural love path. Which, which is what most of us is trying to do. We're trying to do it all ourselves. And that's why all of you are finding it very hard because the majority of you are trying to do it yourselves all the time. And of course it's very hard. And this is one of the things we haven't appreciated at the soul level. We, we believe that just because we believe something in our mind that it makes it a reality. And it doesn't. What you believe in your soul is real, not what you believe in your mind. I said so to Mary some weeks ago that myself and Mary live in two completely different worlds. Right? She lives in the world that her beliefs create. And even though we live next to each other, she lives in the world that her beliefs create and I live in a completely different world that my beliefs create. We, we live totally separate, separate lives, really, in a lot of ways. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because Mary's beliefs about God, motion, and all these other things are all completely different to mine. And as a result, we can live in the same house and have completely different experiences in our lives. Right? Because what you believe is what you will attract and create. And for many of us, what we believe in our soul is very, very different from what you think is in your soul or, and that is really only in your mind. And this is a very important to get real about what's in the soul because if you don't get real about what's in the soul, 
nothing can heal. Now, the reason why I bring all of this up, because all of that was an aside to the reason why I brought it up. And the reason why I brought it up is this. What heals a person? You, you say you have a passion for healing. And what heals the person? What, what is it? What, what's involved? Who's it? Let's, maybe if we can start firstly by saying, who's involved in healing a person? Can we, can we, can we answer that question? Who, who do you think is involved in healing a person? God. So God. And the person. The person. So God, the person. And you yourself. Well, there, there's, so I'm the person being healed and there's God. Right? Who else? The healer. But who's the healer? God. No, no. Not necessarily. And I'll tell you why. Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit never heals you. It's the truth that heals, isn't it? Oh, it can do, but only under certain circumstances. The conjurance. Well, the conjurance of the Holy Spirit, but I'm talking about two more entities. There's two more entities that you're missing in the process of healing. Spirits. Spirits who are in a better condition than yourself. So let's define them as that. And? And the person who's in a better condition. And the person on earth who's in a better condition than yourself. Who's attempting to heal you? Does that make sense? So there's four people, if you like, four entities involved in the process of healing. Now, when you become at one with God, you only need two of those entities, God and yourself. Does that make sense? That's your goal. That's the goal in the end. God and yourself, that's it. Uh, and you become a conduit for healing through that process. However... Until that point of time is reached, there are two other people involved. There's a spirit person involved who's, who's basically channeling their energy of some kind. And it might not be a spirit who's at one with God. It might be, not be a spirit even on the divine love path. And in fact, the majority of times it's not, particularly with the way you're engaging your healing at the moment. Almost all the time it's not. Right? It's actually a spirit on the natural love path using their energy that they have working through you, the healer, and all they're doing is not, they, they can't work through your soul because there's so many blockages to God's love in your soul. So what they do is they use the ectoplasm in your body to heal the person that you're with. Does that make sense? And this is what happens on earth today. What happens on earth today is God is often taken out of the picture completely because neither the person on earth who's the healer nor the person on earth who's being healed nor the spirit who's actually trying to do the healing on, through the person who's the healer, none of them recognise the power of God in that process generally. And so God's often out of the picture completely. Right? Then for the person on earth who's getting healed, they usually have very little faith in any of the processes involved, even the spiritual processes involved. They have very little knowledge about them. And so naturally their soul is putting up this huge wall basically to getting healed in any way. And the poor person who's the healer, often they're in an as dark and sometimes even darker condition than the person getting healed. And the only reason why they're in the room is because they have rapport, a connection with the spirit who's using their physical body to heal somebody else. That's how John of God heals. Does that make sense? That's how all these famous, so-called famous healers heal at the moment. Can I? If we have a mic over there. So I was shown a picture recently very similar to that of the corral in Through the Mists where all these people who are at one with God are the conduit for God's love. Is that...? Yeah, the corral, hardly anybody in that auditorium was at one with God. Oh, sorry. No, the, yeah, the guy on the floor. Yeah, Siamedes. Yes, the healer. Siamedes, he the was healer. At, he was at one with God. And, and the people in... So the, the picture that I had is... You require the person who's at one with God to have some ability and rapport with the person on earth. But then the next picture that was shown to me was the damage of the people on earth who are trying to do the healing and how it's nearly impossible for a celestial to have any rapport exactly. to allow that flow to go through then to the person who exactly. requires the healing. Exactly. 
And so what happens is that person generally attracts a whole group of natural love spirits who all project their energy through the person and they get a bit of temporary healing done in the person. But of course the person walks away and six months later they've still got the same problem and they come back and it's rare for there to be a permanent healing. There are permanent healings that occur through that process because of the openness of the individual at the time and other reasons, but it's pretty rare. Yeah. Right? Very rare, in fact. And there was, it was almost like I was showing that only through certain things that we have worked through ourselves is the love able to trickle through then to that person. And exactly. any resistance that we have or anything we're not looking at or... Exactly. Just, you know... So we're really stuff. taking potluck. Yeah. Right, based on what particular emotional injuries I have as the healer on earth, if you like. And I, and I wouldn't even term them the healer. They, they're really, in a way, the conduit or the, the, channel. the channel for yeah. the healing to take place. Now, that doesn't always need to be ha happen because you, if you're at one with God, then now you are the direct connection between God and the individual. Yeah, cool. So, of course, you can heal many things under those circumstances. That's the goal, right? Yeah. But, but up until that time, there's all these other chain of events going on. And the only healing that can ever take place is when the person doesn't have a particular emotional injury that would prevent a certain amount of love flowing in a certain direction for a certain problem. Now, because many of us are full of addictions, we, have, we are full of all these blockages of the flow of energy from ourselves to any other person on earth. And as a result of that, we become very ineffectual healers and we're only occasionally able to heal somebody or benefit somebody yeah. through, through our actions. Now, why do we do that? Why do we engage in that kind of healing? Well, primarily, it's just because we're arrogant. Because if we were humble, we would do something completely different. Right? If we were humble, we would say to ourselves, okay, my role as the physical healer, right, the person on earth as a physical healer, my role now needs to be first to work on myself. Because I, if I am, am not working on myself, then I can never be in a condition where, or, or I'll never be in a condition where it's, I'm pretty open to influencing others. Now, one of the things that started this discussion was with Denny and Sam, and we had a discussion about the iris and how the soul condition is reflected in the eye. Now, the question, many of you have had your eye looked at, right, over the last few years or over a period of many years. What have you found? Have you found changes in the iris? Now, Denny has said in his, his years and years of, of working on people, he's never seen a change in the iris except for the worst. <laughs> right? And even then, it was only occasionally because most of them were adults and they hardly ever changed. Right? The only other time was with the children. Yeah, there was something in there, not something in their eye when they're two, and then when they're a ten, it was in their eye. And so, and, and a negative thing. Now, if we were progressing towards God, and if we were dealing with our, all of our addictions, and if we were becoming more loving, and if we were working in a sincere way towards our own healing with our relationship with God, can you see the results would be different? So this tells us that for the majority of us, we've yet to engage the process with God, even though we think we have. Right? And you know, the most damaging thing you can do is to think you're doing something that you're not actually doing. Because you know what happens then? You don't try to do it because you think you've already done it or you think you're already doing it. You don't try. That's very damaging. Yeah. Right? And this is, the, this is the problem we face. If you believe, on one hand, that the I reflects the soul, and then on the other hand believe that you are developing a relationship with God, but your I is not demonstrating the difference or the growth in that relationship, then it's proof that you're not. And if you're not, but you're telling yourself you are, then what are you doing? Lying. <laughs> well, not only are you lying, but there's something else you're doing. You're engaging a process that you believe is the process to healing, and it's not. You're going down a path that is just another one of those dead-end paths. You believe you're following the divine love path, and you're not. Um, I 
I've just got a bit of confusion happening about um, the kind of preliminary work that is required to get into a space of greater humility. Do you know what I mean? Like the scraping away of the blockages and stuff like that. Obviously, while you're scraping away blockages, a lot of these blockages will not have an effect on your soul because you, you, you're not yet allowing divine love to flow completely. However, if you think about it, if we go back to the core principles of what I've just stated in the beginning, which was the most powerful thing is divine love from God's perspective and the most powerful thing you can ever develop inside of yourself is prayer and faith. These are, these are the three things that you need. Right? Now, if you focused your development on those particular things, can you see the other things would automatically start getting triggered? All of the blockages you have would automatically start getting like pushed, all the buttons would be getting pushed every single day under those circumstances because you'd be there trying to develop some faith in God that God has love to give you and you'd be feeling like, I don't really have any faith in God actually, now that I think about it. Right? And then what, you would you, what, would, what would you do if you had true desire? Um, if you realise you had no faith? Well, you, I don't know. I'm what would you do? <laughs> Having a meltdown. If you had true, if you had true <laughs> desire, what would you do if you had no faith? Have and a you had meltdown. True desire <laughs> for God. Keep, just keep working on it. Decide to have some faith. Right. Well, Grow faith. Exactly. Well, yeah, this is one problem that each of you are having. You're not very logical at this point. And the reason why you're not very logical is because you have so many emotions that prevent you from being log logical. Does that make sense? Now, it would make sense to me if faith was my problem that my next effort should be about addressing faith. Give up addressing anything else in that moment and focus on what's the problem with my faith. What, I, what kind of things might you discover in that? process you might realize that wow i actually believe that like eagle you know that i've just that god's a sadist like why would i want to have a relationship with god about that and then you'd pray about that and try to feel about that and get into some of those emotions or you might be like you might feel like i don't even know if god exists the reality is i've never felt god like all i'm doing is relying on the word of somebody else who's telling me god's existing you know and that guy thinks he's Jesus as well. What an idiot. And so half the time, you know, you don't even know whether God exists or not and that you can trust that God exists. Now, why is that? What are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about that? You're going to have to do some investigation of your own about whether God exists or not, aren't you? Whatever the problem is, is the thing that you need to resolve. So if faith is the problem, then resolve faith. Does that make sense? For me, it's kind of going like this, though, because you're like, okay, you need faith. You need... Oh. <laughs> Meltdown. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you need to get rid of the blockages before you're in a certain place, but you need to get to that... You, you need to focus... Oh, dear. You need to focus on faith and trust in God. But, if you, what but I'm you saying, need to get rid of the blocks to focus on that in the first place. Well, no, I don't agree with that. You know, so you focus if you've been on told, it and that will reveal the blocks. Exactly. Yeah. If, it, if, if you've been told that God exists and God is loving and God desires to give you love, you've been told it. Right? I've told you this like, how, how many times since I met you? Maybe. <laughs> maybe a thousand, right? So you've been told that. You don't really believe it. Because if you really believed it, your actions would be very different, right? So you don't really believe it. And that's fine. You've been told it. Now, while you've been told something, it doesn't mean there's going to be any change in your soul. I agree. Right? Just somebody telling you something means there's no change in your soul, except for one change, and that is a, a position of awareness develops. Right? And the position of awareness is, oh, maybe there is a God <laughs> who loves me. Maybe. You know, it seems logical that there would be a God who loves me. Um, when you look at the logic of different things in the universe and, and when you start looking at our body and all the other things involved in terms of an intelligent designer, then it would seem to be a logical thing. So let's experiment. So that's what you did, if you think about it, back, back at the beginning. You experimented, and at that point in time, your faith was pretty low, right? You could say. Yeah. But you received some divine love. I think so. Well, you must have, because otherwise you <laughs> well, wouldn't Well, I changed my mind. Yeah, exactly, but I don't about know. God's existence. Yeah. Which is a pretty big thing to change your mind about. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you didn't believe in God before then, and then after then you did. So, so that's a pretty big thing to change your mind on. So something happened. Right. Right? Yeah. Something that was a big enough shift inside of you, 
even with all your blockages, for you to change your mind. Does that make sense? Yep. So what does that tell me? That to tells me that you didn't have to deal with your blockages. Oh. Did you? Yeah, okay. For that particular new truth to you, what did you have to deal with? I just had to have an experiment with God Reliance. That was, God God that was sincere. Yeah. That's all you needed to do and be open to the results. So this whole trying to get rid of your block so you become in a state where you have more faith in God is totally the wrong way, is self-reliant and the wrong way around. Well, a lot of times, yeah, I feel so. Like, you do need to get rid of your blockages in order to be at one with God. I agree. You will get rid of all of your blockages when you're at one with God. I agree with that too. However, when you focus on them like you do, without focusing on the more important qualities, such as the reception of divine love, faith, and your desire for God, for the relationship with God. Remember that this is about a relationship with God that can only be created through your desire. Now, sure, your desire will ebb and wane based on the different blockages you have. But if, if you're sitting down today and you go, yeah, I don't have any desire for God today whatsoever. At least that would be a better place than going, I'll pray for 10 minutes, trying to convince myself that I have a desire for God when I don't. I'll be closer to finding my blockages when I'm honest with myself. But if I'm focused on what do I need to have a relationship with God, prayer and faith on my part and reception of God's love on God's part, which is always there waiting for me to come to, to, come to God for it. Now, if I focused on that as my primary focus in my day-to-day -day life, can you see all the blockages will become self-evident? Yeah. And if yeah. I don't have a desire to deal with them, then, of course, I'll have to bear the consequences of such lack of desire, which is I will be stagnant for as long as I don't have the desire to deal with the block. Right? But if I focused on those two primary things, prayer and faith, I would expose the majority of my blockages in those two qualities and therefore be able to have some sincerity about whether I truly want to be different or not in terms of my actions and my desires for God. Does everyone get that, what I've just said? Because it's so important that you understand that, I feel. Like this is one of the reasons why many of you are getting stuck. Because you don't have a desire for God. It's the divine love path. It's like God is the primary part of the path. Without a desire for God, nothing. You're not going to stick this path. You're not. Without a desire for God, sooner or later, guaranteed, you're going to leave this path no way, there's no alternative, actually. Right. I'm recognising that um, I thought I had a, a really strong desire for God and just hearing you talk today is making me aware that there's a little bit of one there but it's not something I'm even actively trying to grow. No, and you have not hardly any desire for God's laws at all which is an indication of how little desire for God you have. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. You, see, you see, if we truly have a desire for God, we would understand that all of God's laws are loving, so I want to know them all. Why would I not want to know them all? Yeah. I'd want to spend a lot of my time trying to find them all, wouldn't I? Yeah. If I really loved God and I really had a desire for God and I really believed that God was a God of love and all of God's laws were loving, I'd want to find every one of them. Like, why do you think I've spent most of my time in my 2,000 years of life finding God's laws? Because they tell me things about God. They, they show me things about God that I didn't know before. So then my question is, for to have a desire to be a part of a group that facilitates healing or, you know, is, is helping people, um, and for myself with mediumship, if my desire for God is minuscule, mm -hmm. then am I, I'm immediately out of harmony with love engaging that desire of channeling for people or tr attempting to... No, I'm not saying stop en engaging your desires at all. See, well, I don't... I, I realise that you wouldn't say that, but no, I but get see, confused about... But there's the inference in your question. So I'm not saying give, don't, I'm not saying give, give up your desires if they're not pure. What am I saying? Purify your desires yes. if they're not pure. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you know? But that, that's something, that's a theme that I noticed came up a lot. With In the all group. of our interactions. It's like, oh, somebody said we're out of harmony with love. We'll stop. 
and none of us You'll will ever get anywhere away. if we do that. We well, have you to. Run away. And it, that's yeah. something you have said to me. Every time I've made a mistake about channeling or mediumship and I've told you what it is and you go, yeah, yeah, that's great that you've discovered that, but don't stop. Yeah, don't stop. And, uh, and in recent weeks I've sort of been questioning that, going, well, okay. You, you've got to ask yourself whether you have a pure desire to purify your desires. Okay. You see, many of you don't. You, you, when you get told that something's wrong, you run away. That tells me you don't, have a pure, you don't have a desire to purify your desires. All you have a desire is for somebody to come along and say, oh, that was so wonderful. Isn't that beautiful that you did that? So what's that called? An addiction. An addiction, <laughs> yes. You have a desire to have your addictions met. See, see, a person who has a pure desire will continue doing what they desire no matter what anybody around them says. I feel a lot of joy when I'm engaging my desires mm -hmm. and I get ex a lot of stuff gets exposed of where it's not pure mm -hmm. and I miss a lot of it as well. But when it is exposed, what do you do? I have to stop. No, and, uh, you see, I wouldn't stop, but it, it, when it gets exposed, it, what do you really do? And let's be honest now. So well, you've got to be honest. What do you do when these, desire, these impure desires get exposed? What's your current course of action? Because you, you demonstrated it with the group. I run away. You run away. Yeah. Why? Well, I feel ashamed and humiliated for getting it wrong. And you don't want to feel shame or humiliation. And whose shame and humiliation is it? It's not the group trying to humiliate you or shame you. No, it's you. mine. No, but, but, but who created it? In this case, who created well, it? Well, I did by breaking the law. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's, and, and, and you're not prepared to look at the, which law you broke. <laughs> you just want to go away and nurse all of your humiliation and shame that you yourself created, which is a result, is a painful result, of breaking the law, and you don't want to examine what law you broke. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so, of course, has anything changed? No, nothing will change. The next time you get, after a month, you know, you've been humiliated and shamed long enough <laughs> and you sort of feel like, oh, you know, I've paid the penalty of that humiliation and shame because I've worked my way through that and cried about that or whatever else. Let go of that emotion. That's fantastic, right? But has anything in the soul changed? No, because I still don't know what made me do it. Exactly. And if you don't know what made you do it, what's going to happen? I'll keep doing it. You'll do it again. And I don't want to do yeah. that. And then you'll have the same feeling of humiliation and shame when somebody points it out to you. And you know what happens with most people with that cycle? They get to the point where they don't want to be with anybody who causes them to feel the results of their own breaking of the law. That's what, what they get to. They get to the point where they don't want to associate with anybody who might bring up that same emotion, right? Because the emotion is painful and they keep feeling it all the time. And then keep feeling it all the time because they keep breaking law and they don't want to see why. But if you don't, if you're aware that, look, I know the detriment and the responsibility that you talked about, mm -hmm. maybe not fully emotionally, but... No, to be honest, if you fully emotionally knew it, you'd be spending a lot more time sorting out your own life than you currently spend. <laughs> so, so, but continue. <laughs> so I know that when... Um, I channel for someone or I do any body work or anything like that, the potential for damaging them further is huge. Yeah. And I don't really want to do that to a person. I don't agree. You do. I don't agree that you don't. There's two reasons why I can prove to you that you can do. Okay. You keep doing it even though you don't change. So that's proof that you do. You're prepared to damage the person as long as your addictions get met. As long as your addictions get made, you're going to keep doing this. Right? And secondly, if you were truly sincere in what you just said, you would address the underlying emotional cause as to why the problem has occurred inside of yourself. And you don't do that either. You avoid that. You run away from that. So that engaging my desires is not done from a place of purity. I agree. So purify it. Okay. So change what you do here. So, so instead of going, I'm going to run away and not engage my desires, that would be a disaster. Why do we want to do that? Instead of doing that, you go, okay, it's been pointed out to me all the different ways in which my desires are not pure. Instead of me running away this time and instead of me going to the same cycle, same cycle, or even getting to the point where I decide I'm just not going to do it anymore or getting to the point where I get to the point where I don't want to be with anybody who's going to expose any of my unloving <laughs> desires. 
Instead of doing that, engage this process with God actively because you love God, because you love truth, because you desire to have a relationship with God, not for any other reason. Engage the process with God and all of these impurities will just start getting triggered. And if you're sincere in this relationship with God, they'll also get addressed. Okay. Right? But many of you don't want to do that. Right? That's why many of you felt nervous even coming here, because you don't want to do it. Right? What you would like to do instead is to be told oh, a whole heap of good things about yourself, right? many of which you will not believe anyway because of the emotions that are in you <laughs> that mean that you don't believe <laughs> or anything that good that anybody says about you. Right? So you're not going to believe it anyway. That's one reason why you have the addiction. You go, I go, you tell me that it's good. Okay, that wasn't enough. John has to tell me that it's good and that wasn't enough. Lily, so Lily's got to tell me it's good. that's still not enough. I need every one of you here to tell me that it was good. And that still doesn't feel like enough. <laughs> you know, like, and that's what our addictions are like. The reality is you wouldn't need anybody to tell you that it was good if you knew it was good. If you really felt it inside of your soul, you wouldn't need anybody to tell you. That's the reality. So needing a person to tell you is an addiction. Right? And it's an addiction based upon something that you don't want to address inside of yourself all the time, every single time. So these are the issues you face, I feel, as a group, right? The issues you face is that you want to get away with breaking the law. You want to continue healing other people because you're in addictions doing it and you get a lot of those addictions met when you do it. And then you want to be told that it's all good and you also want to not hear from anybody who tells you otherwise. And as a result, what, would, what do you think the result's going to be? Breaking law, breaking law, breaking law. What's the result? Pain and pain suffering. Pain and suffering, pain and suffering. And pain and suffering for the people you're yes. helping. Pain and suffering for them too. Of which your soul will at some point bear the pain of as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so there's all that as well. It's a compounding going effect. Just a, just a compounding effect. Yeah. Now, I would recommend that you really engage your passions and desires for healing. So I'm not saying don't do that. What I'm saying is, purify them, right? Don't run away, don't avoid, you know? How many of you, when I brought up some of these things, like we, I got quite a few emails back, I don't want to go now, I don't want to go now. Even the first few things I heard back about the group, you know, where things weren't going good, and it depends too. For some of you, it wasn't going sort of in the divine love path, and so, so you didn't want to go anymore, right? And I think... Corny expressed that to me, Jane expressed that to me, uh, sorry, Anto expressed that to me, and you expressed that to me, uh, that you didn't feel it was going in harmony with... But you, and I, my first question was, have you spoken up about that? And the answer was, no. no. And I, what's your addiction? <laughs> Let's use a mic. Not, not wanting to be... <laughs> so Jane's addiction is... Of not wanting to be direct and honest. In a group. In a group. But can I say something? Sure. There's something I'm still struggling with in what Nat's talking about. Sure. Because I feel there's something similar with myself. Mm -hmm. I feel it's hypocritical to, I don't know, to continue, like, work, I don't know, if I've got all these errors, if I'm not wanting to work it's only, on myself. When are you a hypocrite? What's a hypocrite? I feel like I'm a hypocrite now what, after what is hearing a, everything. Let's define a hypocrite, like, Jane. What is a hypocrite? Let's no, define someone... I don't know, someone trying to, I don't know, no, I just feel like a hypocrite. Like it's yeah, just... I know you feel like a hypocrite, but let's define a hypocrite. What, what is a hypocrite from a definition of the word? And if you don't know, that's fine, we'll ask somebody else. Know. That's okay. Point, yeah. yeah, just stay with the conversation though. What is a hypocrite? You got... A person that tells someone to do something and not doing it themselves. themselves? themselves? Yeah. Yes, that's one. A person who puts on a facade, yes. Uh, okay, so, so how do you stop being a hypocrite? So, by refining yourself. So by engaging the process yourself and telling the person you're trying to assist that I'm engaging my process myself and I found the other day that I, was, I had this emotion and I had that emotion by being truthful and honest about the true condition. You don't have to stop your desires under those circumstances. Yeah, but I just feel like everything that you've said today, like, I just feel like, shit, I'm right at the start. Like I'm not even, I don't know, I just That's feel like okay. I'm being so hypocritical. 
No, you, no, a hypocrite is a person who claims they are something than they're not. See, I, I, I feel you're being a more honest person now. And I think that's wonderful. What do you think you need to do to he help somebody heal? You need to help them become a more honest person, just like you're demonstrating right now. Do you see? Your example right now is better than maintaining the facade that, oh, I think I'm going really great, everything's going really good, I'm going fine, everything's fine, and in reality, everything's not. That's a hypocrite. Now, that doesn't feel like you currently feel. The hypocrite feels arrogant. The hypocrite feels like, you know, they know everything, they're doing everything right. That's how the hypocrites are. That's why I called the Pharisees in the first century hypocrites. They were the ones going around saying they were doing all these things and weren't doing any of them. Now, that's not what you would do if you were sincere. If you were sincere, you'd say, look, I'm, I, I have a sincere desire to help other people. And this desire remains within you. Yes? I have a sincere desire to grow myself. This desire remains within you. I know that I'm a work in progress. Yeah. I'm saying I know that I'm a work in progress. <laughs> Do you know you're a work in progress? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, if you know you're a work in progress and you know you have these sincere desires, if you were truly humble, what you would do is engage all of them and be humble to the consequences. That's what you would do. And avoiding them is not being humble to the consequences. And this is what many of you do. Many of you, when I have a discussion with you, you go, oh, I'm not going to do that now. And I'm going, if this was a sincere desire, you would still stay doing it. And if you had a sincere desire to be humble, you would stay doing it even knowing what you now know. And you would refine yourself. That's what you would do. So you've got to ask yourself, am I humble if every time I receive some truth about myself, all I want to do is run away and not engage my desires anymore? Am I humble? Well, no. The answer is no. If, you, if you're not engaging your desires every single time that your desires become present, and you, and you decide that you're going to withhold from engaging desire because of the potential of some kind of feedback that might happen in the future, you're not humble. If you were humble, you'd engage your desire knowing that you've got to refine it somehow and that there will be a feedback system that God's got in place. God's beautiful with all of God's laws. God has this feedback system in place and God will refine you. Isn't that wonderful? You don't think it's wonderful, James. That's why you go into judgment and, re and go away and sort of nurse yourself in a protective cocoon. Because that's not humble either. You believe it's humble, but it's not. You believe that's not being a hypocrite, but it is. That's the part that's the hypocritical. See, a person who's truly engaging the principles of the divine truth, they wouldn't do that. What they would do is they'd go, wow, all that hit me. That's a lot of truth that hit me, right? And then they'd go, I want to change this. I want to grow from this. I want to actually engage this truth now and still engage my desires, but now refine them based on what I now know the truth to be. That's what I would do. So whenever you have this strong desire to step back from something when you've got feedback, this is an indication of a lack of humility not of humility. It's an indication of, a, of hypocrisy, not a lack of hypocrisy. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's hypocritical for you to believe when you're in an imperfect state that you're perfect or that you should be. You don't have to be perfect, right? Does God require perfection of you right now? Well, if God did, you'd all be perfect right now. God. God's saying you're not perfect because you're engaging your will out of harmony with my laws. Does that make sense? And if, if that gets exposed to you, then surely the best course of action is not to go into a hole, but rather go, wow, that's been exposed to me now. I know now what I was doing there was out of harmony with love. So change your action. Change your heart as well. You know, work on what caused that. Don't avoid it. Right? Many, re many re reasons why you feel nervous whenever you're in my company 
is because you wish to avoid the truth. Now, is a person who's humble wish to ever avoid the truth? No. The person who's humble wants the truth. And they're not afraid of getting more truth. Right? A person who's humble is not afraid of getting more truth. A person who's humble wants more truth. They take every opportunity possible to get more truth. That's what a person who's truly humble does. Does that make sense? And this is why this kind of idea has to... So you know this is an error within you, right? Is feeling... I want to get past that. I want to get past that so I can want to desire truth, but I know the reality is I don't want to. Yep, so yeah, now that you know that's the reality, do something to change that reality. Do something. So, so you know that every time you try to push the truth away, you're breaking one of God's laws, that, you, that progression is not possible, you know that. You know the only reason why you're avoiding truth is because you're unwilling to feel some pain within you. So talk to God about that. Talk to, talk to your spirit friends. Help me every single time I do this. Help me see what I'm doing every single time, you know. And when you engage your passions and desires in that regard, you'll get plenty of help. At the moment, many of you are just totally tying up your spirit friends. You know, you, you sort of say, I only want you there to tell me good things about myself. Right? Do you get it? <laughs> you tell me anything bad about myself and I don't want you around me anymore. Except if you're calling an eye then it's like, you can only tell me bad stuff about myself. I don't want any good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's often the opposite of that as well, right? <laughs> but either way, you are not being humble and truthful. Does that make sense? If you were humble and truthful, you wouldn't do that. You would say, I want you to be my friend. And that means telling me everything possible. And I'm going to develop within myself the desire to know everything and the desire that, 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 that is both good and bad within myself. And I'm trying to develop within myself the desire to develop a stronger desire for God and so forth and develop more faith, which will come to me if I receive some more divine love. Obviously, faith will obviously come. But before the, faith, before the love comes, I still need to have some faith to even want to be loved, mm -hmm. some faith in God at least. And if I develop these qualities inside of myself, I won't be shying away from truth all the time. I won't be nervous every time I'm in the company of somebody who might tell me the truth. I'd be overjoyed to be in the company of someone who wants to tell me the truth and particularly someone who wants to tell me the truth coming from a loving space where they, where, where they care about me. And if I believe they don't care about me, look at their, look, I'd look at their actions and go, what are their actions? Yeah, they're always kind. They're always considerate. They're always quite firm. But they're also always... like They, they never try to, you know, remind me ten times later of all the problems that I have. You know, they, they, they never treat me differently after they know the truth about me. These are all indications that they love you, right? Mm -hmm. not, not what your parents might have been like or what other friends might have been like who basically tell you the truth when they're in a rage, mm -hmm. but someone completely different to that. And, and then you'd want to be in their company. And if you can't be in their company, you'd be listening to everything they've got to say. You'd be, try, you'd be trying to put it into practice, surely. That's what you would do. For many of us, that's not what we're doing. Well, what we're doing is we're going, ah, oh, not more truth. Like, and for many of us, it's not even quite that mild. <laughs> Don't tell me any more truth. I can't handle it anymore. <laughs> right? That's how we really feel inside. And that's why we go, you know, we're nervous and every time we're around AG's company, we sort of, you know, like, and this is what I feel from you. I go, yeah, I can't share more truth with you. I can feel from you this lack of desire for truth. What, and what, what's it caused by? It's caused by sometimes it's an underlying feeling of self-judgment that you need to release. Right? or some other emotions that you need to release. And, and the key, and it might be also arrogance that you need to release. It might be those kind of feelings that we need to release. But, but if we release them, then we no longer have the impediment. And once we no longer have the impediment, we can grow. Now, if we can grow, we have the ability to help the people around us grow. Right? And I feel that many of you want to be healers. What you're trying to do is help people around you grow when you're not willing to grow yourself on exactly the same issues that you're trying to help other people grow, 
And you're also not willing to grow in your relationship with God. So who are you going to attract helping you assist with your healing? Natural love spirits. Who are just going to be mostly feeding your addictions or if they're not feeding your addictions, feeding their own. Can I ask to give, uh, to give us a perspective of the group that you see the potential that can be achieved here? So you want to hear all the good things? <laughs> uh, I want to hear the direction. The Sh sure. My, my suggestion for the group is this, and, and maybe I'm jumping a bit ahead of what I wanted to talk about, but, but that's fine. Um, my, my feelings are this. Each member of this group needs to develop a strong desire to, for prayer and faith. These are the two things that have the power to change you more rapidly than anything that, or, or most of the things you've been already engaging. Right? That's number one. Developing the two qualities of prayer and faith. If you are ever going to be of assistance to any other person on this planet, these particular qualities, you, once you develop them, you will understand that all of the changes that are going to happen to your soul won't happen because of the work you've done. They'll happen because you, of the work that the love does in your soul. Does that make sense? God's love I'm talking about does in your soul. And all the work you have to do is to be open to it and to be humble and to desire truth and have some faith that it's all going to come. That's all you've got to do. Right? A child can understand that. And the reason why many of you are not progressing is because you're still adults thinking the way adults do, <laughs> not being a child who can just understand those basic principles. So that's number one. Understand the importance of prayer and faith. Two, understand that you have blockages to prayer and faith. Those blockages are because you have false beliefs about love. And they are all driven by your addictions that you want to hold on to. And why do you want to hold on to your addictions? Because your addictions help you maintain a facade and make you feel loved when you're not. Do you see that? It makes you feel loved when you are not loved. Right? Many of you are conscious of the fact you're not loved and the only time you feel loved is when you have an addiction met. Right? Now, that is the problem with these addictions. They don't help you see the truth about love. So the second thing for the group is to focus on each other and your own, primarily, addictions. What are the addictions you know are occurring inside of yourself? that cause you to do, act, say the things you do, act and say. What are they? What are these addictions? Now, if you spent the next year doing that, because it might take you about a year doing that, right? and you're really sincere about it. Only if you're sincere, otherwise it would take you five. Sam would be able to take a photo of your eyes and you would find there would be major changes in every single one of you, if you had actually done it. Does that make sense? Now, if there's changes in you, now you have the ability to help other people make those same changes. But you only have the ability to help other people make the same changes you have made. Because any change you have not made, it's, it's impossible for you to help another make it. Does that make sense? So if I still feel a lot of rage and anger towards men inside of me, any person who comes to me is not going to be assisted in their grief or anything related to their relations, relations with men. Right? until I have done some changes. They're going to feel, they, they can just lay on my table, sit down in the chair <coughs> next to me, and they will feel from me that I have not made a shift in that area at the soul level. And they know they cannot open their mouth on that subject, and they know they cannot do anything 
that will actually ha have any benefit to themselves in exposing anything along this particular subject that I have yet to hear. So we need to understand, the third thing I feel the net group needs to understand is, anything you do not heal in yourself cannot be healed in another. And that applies no matter what spirits you have with you. So you can have some lovely divine love spirits with you who would normally do the healing. And while you have a blockage to healing a particular thing in you, the energy from them that's healing in that particular respect is going to be blocked by you and therefore not be able to heal the person you're with. So even if they attempted to heal the person that you were with, they could not do it. It's a waste of their time. Now, a natural love spirit will try to do it. Right? But he won't have any permanent success because he can't. Now, that, I feel that if those three things were done by, by the group, you'd have a very, a very effective healing group. Yeah? So in terms of meetings, when we do a meeting, because all these things we can do on our own. I agree. What would you, what's the benefit to do it in a group? The benefit of doing it in a group is you can get together and remind yourself of your focus of, to, do, to do these things individually. Does that make sense? So we talk about each other's progress. And... Yes, but also you can, you can feel the addiction. See, see, each of you are different. Each of you have different addictions. Right? There, any addiction you have, you will not be able to feel in another. But any addiction you do not have, you will be able to feel in the other. So now you have the benefit of seeing the other's addictions that you like, can't feel, and they have the benefit of seeing yours that you can't feel. Does that make sense? You have the benefit of seeing theirs that they can't feel, and they have the benefit of seeing yours that you can't feel. Now, if you were truly humble, you'd take that opportunity to allow the exposure of these particular addictions. Does it make sense? Yeah. So yeah. we'll play the truth game without the dare. Yes, yeah, but, 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 it, but not treat it as a game, nor, nor, as a, um, nor, nor in an unloving manner. Yeah. Treat, treat it as a, as a sincere desire to get to know the individual, have compassion for their particular issues, and, and to all grow from their particular experience. You see, the key for a group is firstly to know yourself well. Because if I know I've still got this injury and that injury and this injury and I've got a client who's come along to get healed, let's say, let's call them a client, i just call them a person, but let's call them a client who's come along to get healed and I know that I've got their injuries, what's my best choice? <laughs> to hand them over to a person that I know doesn't have those <laughs> particular injuries. And say, look, I'm sorry, but I've got the same injuries you have and, uh, and, and you know, I can't help you really with it. I need to maybe hand you over to somebody who doesn't have that particular injury. And then they might be able to help you with that. I've seen that sometimes unfold in the process Nat, of... Nat, Nat, Nat. Nat you, Mike, yeah. Can I ask one more? Uh, sure, yeah. sure, can we, uh, yeah, yeah. Fine. In terms of uh, the ways that we you potentially will heal in the future, can you give us a... No, because no. what I would like to do, and, and Corny and myself have discussed this uh, before, is that I would love to see the group experiment. Because, because I can tell you a whole heap of things, but the problem with telling you a whole heap of things is that you will not experiment and you will not have a personal experience. And the only way for you to become effective as a healer is to go through the, your own growth in knowledge that, that is soul-based knowledge, not an intellectual somebody telling you, like giving you something, but rather through experiences that you have, ah, oh, I'm feeling his emotion, I'm feeling my, uh, you know, being able to recognise the difference between the person who you're working with, your own emotion, the spirits with the person you're working with, your own spirits that are with you, both good and evil, and then the spirit who's doing the channeling, feeling that particular person as well with you, and at the same time being open towards God. You can't do all of that by talking about it. You can only do all of that by going through experiences, and this is something that corner will probably do with you, just try to, you know, help you go through this process of getting a connection with God and understanding that all healing will result from that connection and helping you understand the difference between that connection 
which is a compassionate, loving, gentle connection compared with what you've all been doing in the past, mm. right, in terms of the different m modalities of healing you've been engaged in the past. And this also impl implies that whatever area of interest you have, whether it be chiropractic or iridology or hands-on healing or whatever area of interest is, that you engage this particular area of interest refining your condition and, and letting the group show you, experiment on the group, you know, and let the group through their feedback system show you what the problems are that they notice in this particular form of healing you're engaged in, and in particular, in particular, the emotions that you have. So each, of, each one of us will bring our own modality into harmony with God's ways. Exactly. And how you experience your own modality, if you want to call it that, and will, will grow and change as you, as you grow. Many of you are very fixated on having one particular thing you want to do, right, or, or one particular thing you feel attracted to doing. But there are a great many ways of, healing, of helping a person heal. And when I say a great many ways, there's really only one way, but a great many manifestations of that way, if you like. And, and how you choose that is really up to yourself in terms of what keeps you connected with God. Now, if you don't focus on your own relationship with God in this process, then you might as well go and do a training course with a you know, some natural love healer, to be honest. Like, you're going to get the same results as he gets too, by the way. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Because unless you're willing to involve God in this process, which is something that very few people on this planet actually do, and the people who do are mostly Christian, um, you, you're not going to get any changes, really. And the people who are Christian that engage these, they don't understand what they're engaging many times. But, but that doesn't really matter very much because their faith in God and in God's love is quite strong in comparison to your own. Like, there are many Christians on this planet who have a much greater faith in God and desire for God's love than most of you currently do. Mm -hmm. And that's something that obviously needs to change if ever you're going to have an at one relationship with God. Yeah? And, and you could use this group as a tool to help you develop these particular things, but also as a tool to help you develop your desires. Like many of you do have sincere desire to do these things, and that's why we pointed out to Sam and Denny when they come to visit your names. Like we, and, we, and you are not all inclusive, by the way, of people who have a desire. There are many others that we just didn't name <laughs> that might have such a desire that you might recognise in the future and invite them along to your group, but give them the same Feedback, give them the same process that you have gone through. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, just some spirits with Eagle. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk yeah. about that now? Yeah. But what, the reason, well, I've asked Mary to just say the spirits with each person when she notices them. There's been a few already that I didn't mm. want to break the flow, but Eagle, um, there's, I, there's heaps of, I've mentioned it to you before, that they're natural love spirits. And it's a group of guys who really, they hook into your feeling of a desire, the wonder and the mystery, like, mm. and the possibility. And the, and the, the big, um, it's mystery. It's really this feeling of mystery and the wonder of, you can't explain that, but it's like beyond everything that we've ever heard of. Wow. And they, you have that, that feeling in you that's, an addiction to help you avoid some sad feelings inside of you. And and you're very impressed by these natural love spirits because they give you all these impressions of like, you could do this really amazing thing and it would prove to everyone that these things and, you know, but it's really just hooking into an addiction to help you avoid your, your other doubts and your fears and your sadness. And they're also leading you away from the humility of the divine love way. They, they want you to um, create something that's going to wow people because that's how they get their sense of worth and that's how they attach to you as well. Um, but And so some of your resistance, I feel, to doing it the divine love way is that it's very humble and um, it's not, it takes time and the results aren't always 
there when you're starting from a place that everyone's starting at at the moment. Obviously, when we all have heaps of faith and um, connection to God, it'll wow everyone like to the maximum. But it's sort of like you want to jump to that point and that's what they hook into, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel them. I thought you, it was a good question, but what I felt mainly was their influence on, on you emotionally to skip yeah, to this desire. And their insistence is frequently that you they you want to they want to have a a list of instructions to follow. Yep. And that the way, one re, one reason why they want that is because it gives you an opportunity to not have to feel because you, all you've got to do then is follow the instructions. And uh, and what God's trying to teach you how to do is to feel like to to continually continually grow in the capacity and understanding at the soul level, which is all feeling based. And uh, and these spirits haven't done that yet. And that's why they don't feel it's that important to do. Yeah. Now, I know you do feel that's important to do, but uh, sometimes you get an influence away from that. Yeah. Each of you have a group of spirits with you that have different motivations, right? And so, so Jane, you know, when you, get this, when you get this feeling inside of you that you just want to run away from the truth, you know, like you just, and you don't want to engage your desires anymore because it might damage any, somebody, there's a heap of very dark spirits that connect with you in that moment. And they, they greatly influence your capacity to reason in that moment. And, uh, and all they're interested in doing is protecting you from any more truth because they can feel how afraid you are of that particular truth. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And in that moment, you're just almost... To that's why you can't think clearly. You know, when, when you start... In, and earlier, before Lily, when you couldn't think clearly, the, sa the same thing is happening. There's always some spirit influence in that place when you can't think clearly like that. Like divine truth and divine love result in really logical, clear thought. Whenever we don't have logical, clear thought, usually it's the result of a lot of spirit influence. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. Are they both men and women? Yeah, well, there's sort of like this uh, group of people, there's a whole group of women that come along who don't want to be humiliated. And they're quite, they're quite actually arrogant. They don't want to be humiliated. They don't want to have any of their untruth, if you like, inside of them exposed. Mm -hmm. And then you have a lot of men who want to come and just ridicule women. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they just come and just ridicule, ridicule you, but also ridicule those women who are with you. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, that sets up this really antagonistic thing going on around you in the spirit world mm -hmm. where there's a group of men attacking these women ridiculing these women and goading them and there's a group of very angry women as a result feeling humiliated and ridiculed all the time and uh, and all they want to do is withdraw but and but they stay connected both groups can stay connected through yourself does that make sense well if you think about what i've just said you can see sometimes that playing out in your relationship right where something is raised and then there's this desire and you just to shrink back into your hole and and i like feel like sometimes it's just easier to just go. To just go away, yeah. Yeah. And that, that's an indication. Mm. Yeah. That, just hold the mic up. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I was just saying I have a battle with that mm -hmm. a lot too. Yeah. At the moment anyway, or last few months. Yeah. The women get really angry and partly that's why you, they feel like, they, when, just before when you were panicking, they're angry and it's actually, you weren't, you were panicking, <laughs> you weren't projecting their rage, but they were angry at AJ and they're angry at the situation and they, that's what, they influence you, just go away and mm. sometimes you're very angry when you go away and you just... Um, so passive aggressive yeah, rage. Yeah. A, a great way to express rage that many people, many women have learned is to not verbalise it, not yell and scream, but rather just go away and withdraw go into their emotional hole. But it's actually a very rageful place. Yeah. yeah. It's partly influenced by them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they do that with the, you know, the group of men that you attract in this place who goad them and ridicule them. You know, these women are trying to get away from them but they're not realising that they need to work their right way through this particular emotion in order mm -hmm. to prevent these men from coming. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I have to see, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> So now that even puts a lot more. So what are you having? Know, what, like, so what are you doing now? What do you feel now? So, engage. See. Stay yeah, engaged. Oh, I feel. Oh, 
it's coming back to our village. It's too hard. Boink. Yeah, but the, remember that these are all the results of, of acting out of harmony with a law of some kind. Does that make sense? So they're all the results. Everything that's painful is a result of acting out of harmony with the law. So really, and this is something that I've reminded Mary of a lot, like if you, if you had got the feedback Mary had got from myself, and none of you have ever gotten the feedback Mary's got from myself, <laughs> and most of, you, most of you wouldn't handle five minutes in my company that Mary handles. Um, and the reason why is because you still have these deep emotions of self-attack that come whenever truth is exposed. Now, self-attack is an unloving course of action towards yourself. It is breaking the law. Every time you engage self-attack, you are breaking the law of love towards yourself. You understand? Every time you engage self-attack, that's what you're doing. At the moment, it just seems easier to go there. Uh, why, why does it, why? You see, this is what you need to find out. Why would you prefer self-attack? There's got to be something else happening, doesn't there? Can you see that? And you know what it is? You're terrified and you don't want to feel fear. Yeah. And this is the same problem Mary had, is that every time she didn't want to feel fear, she went into self-attack instead. Or attack of another person. Right? Every time she didn't want to feel fear. And all that's happening here is you, you feel afraid. That's all that's happening. You're not letting yourself feel it. And then you revert to self-attack instead. Right? And now, self-attack breaks the law of love. Feeling your fear doesn't break the law of love. Self-attack breaks the law of love, which brings consequences. And part of those consequences are spirit influence. Another consequence is you feel bad about yourself all the time. Right? These are all consequences of self-attack. You're carrying around your mother with you constantly. Does that make sense? And, and you've become her towards yourself. Do you, do you see what I mean by that? It's actually interesting. Um, I was listening to one of your general discussions in 2009 and there was one bit in there that you were talking about at, at birth um, when the female has a negative opinion of herself, the mother, mm -hmm. that that's what gets passed on or, or to the daughters because the daughter didn't feel loved in that place. And so it's interesting um, how, I don't know, how that's come up yeah. at the moment. Yeah. This thing that happens, Jane, where you, where you receive truth and then you, like, freak out and then there's, like, a moment where you choose withdrawal or self-punishment. If you hold the mic up. Yeah, so. Sorry, to not feel the fear in yes. the yes. moment I go the other yeah. way. Yes. Yeah. And the key is to make the decision to feel, feel the, the fear, fear instead. And, it, and just feel like completely overwhelmed. Or I can't, there's a big I can't cope with this feeling that you can feel through. That's what's happened for me. And it's reduced my spirit influence like... Like majorly. Out of, the, out of like, this world, yeah. You know, like we, we had birds attacking our house constantly. <laughs> like all until day Until Mary day. dealt with that particular emotion yeah. and then all of a sudden all the birds no, yeah. no longer attack anything that we have as a result. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can, see, you can see what's happening through the law of attraction. Is it, it brings you these particular things showing you that you're attacking yourself and you're allowing an attack of yourself yeah. and you prefer an attack on yourself. You'll even do it to yourself than you would to feel your fear. That's how, that's how big you see fear at the moment. But that is really honouring fear so much and it's honouring fear above the law of love towards yourself. So at this point in time, what you're doing is you're honouring your fear more than you honour love towards yourself. Now, a person who truly wants to, to practise the law of God in this case would say, no, that's my pattern of the past. What I need to do is stop honouring this fear so much and thinking that it's unresolvable and instead honour the law. The law is I must love myself, right? And if, even if I intellectually come to the point of that, say I must love myself, every time I self-attack, I'm, I'm not loving myself and so therefore I need to change this particular course of action. I need to look at why I self-attack. 
your primary reasons for self-attacking are all about not wanting to feel fear and instead punishing yourself for the fear you feel. Do you, do you see? You're trying to punish yourself for something that it's not loving to punish yourself for. Yeah. And you'll engage, if you keep engaging in this behaviour, it will be cyclical. You'll never get out of it until you break this cycle. <clears throat> Does that make sense? And that's the pain. The pain is every time I break the law of love towards myself, I will experience the pain of breaking such a law. And part of the pain is I attack myself and then feel terrible about myself as a result. That's part of this pain. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Or the give up feeling, you know, that? Like, oh, that's it, I can give up. Yeah. You know, that's, that you can go in the other direction. So every time Mary says to me, oh, that's it, I'm giving up, I go, okay, like, fine, if that's what you want to do, but you're just, you're just you know, running away again. And that's what Anto's been saying. Yeah, hold the mic up. Sorry, that's what Anto's been saying yeah. um, lately, but I'm sort of realising it, but I just feel like I'm stuck in it. Yeah. Well, you so are stuck in it, but you yeah. need to look at your investment, and your investment is yeah. you want to avoid fear. Yeah? Okay. You want to avoid fear. That's your investment. You want to avoid the terror feeling, and as a result of that, you you are going to stay stuck in this while you're trying to avoid terror. So this is all about your investment in terror. You want to keep it inside of you rather than releasing it. That's what you want to do. Also, this other thing happened. As soon as we started giving feedback, <laughs> every, it just went... Burko in here, everyone just went... <laughs> Can you feel like, your distraction straight away? And this feel like, oh, this isn't about me. I don't want to even hear. This, a lot of you don't even want to hear what we're saying to these guys and it's really, like, relevant for everyone. I actually found it hard to go to the toilet because I wanted to hear. I mean, it was like, this is so relating to me right now. I need to hear this. Well, what if we have a break for 10 minutes so everyone can go to the toilet? Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll, uh, then we'll just keep... Do you mind continuing a discussion for another half an hour or so? Because there's a few extra things I'd like to say. And then we'll, uh, and I'm happy to answer your questions, but, but can I just say to you that many of you, as Jane, with this particular situation, many of you are in these cyclical processes that you're, un that you're not getting out of because you're not facing a truth. And you want it that way. You're willing to take the pain of it being that way. And, and that in itself is also not a loving course of action like a willingness to accept pain just because you feel something cannot be resolved, is no, that, that, that's not a place of faith. That's not, a, that's not a place of truth either, by the way. Does that make sense? So, so we need to stop this willingness that each of you have to accept the status quo and start seeing that it, growth is possible much more rapidly than what you've currently or previously experienced but it's only going to be possible under certain conditions. And what we'd probably like to do is just discuss those conditions because they, that will greatly affect the ability of this group to both survive but also to become productive in the future. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So let's have a break for, for 10 minutes or so and just relieve those bladders and... <laughs> <laughs>